Coach Hosek, thank you for taking time with us off the block blog. Uh, last season was uh, historic on so many fronts. You guys were uh, the EIV regular season champion, then you hosted the uh, tournament, but then um, came up short in the uh, conference tournaments. Uh, can you tell us about the emotions of the team and yourself um, going from the high of winning the uh, conference tournament, uh, conference regular season to not uh, winning the tournament? Yeah, it, you know, 2018 season was uh, historic on so many levels, and we had so many accomplishments, uh, almost too many to mention. But, you know, the main ones obviously are, you know, winning the IBA regular season title for the first time in, I think, 24 years. And the first time, I think, in 14 or 15 years that somebody besides Penn State has hosted the IBA championship. And so, you know, that in itself is a major accomplishment that my team uh, talked about wanting to do since I got there. And, um, you know, it, was it a letdown uh, to not win in the in the semifinals? Yeah. I mean, you know, Princeton was a team that, that we felt pretty confident going in against. Um, you know, we'd beaten them twice earlier in the year uh, and felt like hosting was going to be an opportunity for us to, you know, be able to move on to the finals and then, Face a team that either A, we had split against, or B, it was Harvard, which we had beaten twice early, and we felt good about that. So, yeah, that, that part was a little bit of a bummer, but the reality is, is that that's part of the growing pains of any program. You know, you're not going to have, you know, just because you made some changes, you're not just all of a sudden going to win everything. You don't just get to win because you put on the jersey. Uh, and so, you know, it, it was, um, it was a, a, a great year. Uh, it ended on a little bit of a sour note, but all in all, the guys felt really good about the work they had done. You know, we, we had the longest win streak in program history in the conference. We had the conference player of the year, uh, getting a chance to host. I mean, all those things are all really great things. And, and I think that's something that we as a program can hang our hat on and, and feel pretty good about. I, I realize this is a uh, completely new team. We lost three amazing seniors uh, from last year's team. But do you think that sour taste uh, will feel uh, this uh, year's team? Yeah, I mean, you'd like to think so. Uh, you know, we, we've had some team meetings earlier this year where we've talked about, you know, what, what are what are some things that we accomplished? What are some things we have left on the table? Uh, and obviously, you know, every single one of the guys that returned um, all felt like, hey, you know, we, we, we had that within our grasp and we let it go and we didn't, we didn't take care of business. And so, um, I think it's a motivating factor. I, I think if you're not, uh, if you're not a true athlete, I don't care what what level you play, but if you're not a true athlete, I don't think, I don't think that that you could call yourself that if that doesn't motivate you. So, um, you know, I, it's appropriate. I, I like, I like what our guys are doing right now. I like the attitude in the gym. I like how we're working. Um, you know, all those things are real positive. So it's it's fun to go to practice right now. That's for sure. Uh, let's talk about the offseason. How much uh, sort of have you done this time? Uh, Jonathan, I, I shudder to think I, I didn't get to surf once this entire summer. Um, golf has kind of taken over my surfing since I'm a little bit landlocked here. So when I do get a chance to go out and, and get in the water, I definitely go. Uh, my wife and I went down to uh, the Outer Banks earlier in the summer and, and got to spend some a few days down there. And I definitely was wet the entire time. There was just no waves to be had. I was ready to surf. I was ready to go. Uh, but unfortunately it just didn't happen, but yeah, I played a lot of golf, um, you know, did a few house projects and, and spent some time at home. And it was the first time in 12 years, first summer in 12 years that I had not worked for USA volleyball. Uh, I took a little break and then told him, Hey, I, I want to, I'd like a summer to myself for a change and, and work on some other things. And they were gracious enough to give me that break, but, um, yeah, not a lot of surfing, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, like we mentioned, you lost three uh, amazing seniors from last year's team, uh, Ryan Negron, Christian Marius, and uh, Johnny Gomez. Um, what are they up to, and uh, what will you miss most about those? You know, those are three major personalities. Um, the personality in the gym now, the, the culture now without those three is, is I think, obviously a little, uh, a little less intense in the sense that people are really – um, uh, driving the bus besides me, you know, I, you got guys like Brian and Christian and Johnny, and they're all 
just big giant type A personalities. And so you lose that and there's a little bit of a vacuum in the void, but uh, you know, you got some young guys that are stepping up and some new and some guys that have been around for a little bit that, that have waited for their turn to kind of step into those leadership roles. Um, you know, and, and I think that's to be expected. Brian Negron uh, right now is playing professionally over in Italy. Um, Johnny Gomez is finishing up his master's degrees here at, uh, at Mason and, and getting ready for the next chapter in his life. Uh, and Christian has moved on to a, uh, I think it's a consulting company out in Washington, D.C. He's hung up his shoes a little bit and, and uh, has decided to go pursue the real world. So, you know, we wish nothing but the best for them. And, and they're super great ambassadors for our team and our program. And, you know, they come back whenever they can and, and spend some time. And that's always good. No opportunity for Johnny to be a GA in the squad? We, you know what? At Mason, we don't do GAs. Uh, it's just whatever the administration years ago had come up with, they just decided against it. We've invited him to be a part of the gym. I think his class schedule and his work schedule outside of that has been pretty impactful. And, you know, I'll be honest with you, when, when you don't have to get up at 6 a.m. in order to go to practices, you probably take that opportunity and sleep in a little yeah. bit. Uh, I don't blame him. Uh, and, you know, the offer has always been on the table for him to come back and help out in the spring when season is rolling and practice times are a little more feasible and, and conducive to his happiness. So we'll see what happens. Can you tell us how fall camp has been for you with the uh, practices and the scrimmages so far? Yeah, we're, we're about midway through our full time. Uh, you know, we, we've had a couple of scrimmages already against some uh, – uh, we had University of Maryland's club program come in, scrimmage us, and then we had uh, kind of a hodgepodge of some old uh, Mason alum uh, and a few other guys from around the country that were playing PBL for a while come in and scrimmage against our guys. And then this weekend we have um, our big fall tournament. We have 10 other teams coming in. Uh, and then on the 17th we have a scrimmage with us, Penn, uh, let's see, us, Sacred Heart, NJIT, Princeton, and St. Francis. So right smack dab in the middle of it. So far, um, the uh, the intensity of practice has been appropriate. The level of play is actually above where we've been the last couple of years at this time of year, which I'm happy about. Um, you know, we're 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 picking up where we left off in the spring, which is rare uh, for for at least for this program, where we're not kind of reinventing and re you know, uh, reinventing the wheel, so to speak, and, and kind of retuning some things. It's more or less kind of fine-tuning, uh, which from a coaching perspective, that's good. Um, you know, and, and just, you know, we, we're, we're getting after it every day. You know, there, there, there's just no shortage of competition going on. And we, we're, we're a lot deeper than we've been in years past. And, and that's always good, at least from our perspective. And so, yeah, I, I, I've been real happy so far. Uh, it's just, you know, can we rinse loud and repeat or – you know, to be, to be fold when it when the moment counts for it. We'll, we'll see. You've been ta you're talking about uh, not needing to reinvent the wheel, uh, so to speak, for this fall, and that uh, you, you have had yeah more depth than you've had in years past. So, everything considered, what is the biggest culture change that you are proud of in the last four years uh, from when you took over the uh, the uh, program? You know, I I think from my perspective. It's, it's about walking into a gym with a little swagger, having a little bit of an attitude of, of you know, we are, um, you know, a team that deserves to be in the conversation. And, you know, whether or not the rankings have, have borne that out or not, I think is regardless of, uh, you know, whether the work that we're putting in. So I think, I think for me and for my, my staff, you know, we, we want to walk into a gym knowing that we compete and then we're going to we're going to give the team everything we got and and uh, and let the chips fall where they may. And I think our record in the last few years has kind of uh, proven that. And so that's good. We, we like that. We like being a team that, that people take seriously. Uh, we like being a team that people respect and we like being a team that uh, can walk away from a performance feeling good about it at the end of the day. So I think all of those things are things that we're pretty proud of. You mentioned the, the yeah. vacuum that the uh, three seniors uh, that graduated last year um, have uh, created. Uh, let's look on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, can you tell us about the incoming uh, freshman class? Yeah, uh, four really, really nice guys coming in. We've got 6'6 uh, six, six opposite from Virginia Beach named Trey Harris, uh, who is – uh, putting in some real good work and, and, and figuring some things out and, and kind of 
knocking the rust off a little bit. So we're, we're excited about his future. Uh, we've got a local kid, six foot setter named Zach Talamoa, uh, who is right now a, a setter for us, who we project to be a setter in the future for us. Uh, runs a really fast offense, does a lot of the little things really well, has a really high volleyball IQ. Uh, and so I, I really like the future he, he poses for us in the setting position. We got a 6'1 uh, libero from Florida named Trevor Cannon. Also another high volleyball IQ, plays a lot of beach ball back home, has a lot of ball control. Um, you know, he's, he's got a real bright future for the libero position for us. Uh, we got a 6'3 outside hitter from Chicago named Richie Hoff. Um, got an unbelievably good arm uh, and is working real hard in the gym, getting used to the, the passing that needs to happen at this level. Uh, but, you know, he comes in and, and he's putting in the time and he's got just a, a tremendous arm swing. His jump serve is really good and, and that's helping other guys. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm real happy about the class we have that came in this year. I'm going to put you on the spot. You have you can only go with one player. What is one player that we need to keep an eye on that we may not know about right now? That you did not know about or yeah. one that I keep my eye on? Yeah. Okay. Which one? Uh, keep an eye on. Let's go with this. Keep an eye on. I keep an eye on our opposite, Hayden Wagner. Uh, he has got a live arm, uh, a really good jump serve. Uh, I would not be, uh, I would not be surprised if he's in the conversation for another All-American nod this year in terms of, of making the list of people to consider. Um, so I'd, I'd say he's probably the one guy that uh, I would keep an eye on. I, I think if I'm, if I'm seeing somebody that maybe you don't know about, I like our setter a lot, Luigi. Uh, him and J. Cole, Justin Coleman, are doing such great things in our gym that they're both kind of interchangeable. Uh, Justin's been with us for now. This is his fourth year, uh, and this will be Luigi's third year, but two in terms of eligibility, and, and they're both just pushing each other tremendously well. So I think those are the guys that I'd say, if you didn't know about them before, you should. Um, ch uh, change it up a little bit. Uh, yeah. We got, anybody who knows you and follows you on social media knows that you're a big fan of your uh, wife's uh, cooking. Um, so, in terms of her catering business, what is her? On the camera, Jonathan, am I, am I showing a little bit of how much I've uh, appreciated my wife's cooking over the last few years? <laughs> what is her most popular dish to make? Uh, tacos. It's not a question, tacos. Uh, but if you're talking about for catering purposes she actually just did an event this past weekend um for a, a a friend here in the community she made some chicken and waffles that was phenomenal and uh if you did follow me you'll notice that i had to i, I sacrificed i did a little bit of a taste test for her on the night prior to make sure that they were up to par because you know I, I don't want her to put out the family name and, and go out there and put a subpar product out there so it was, uh, they were phenomenal, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm one lucky SOB uh, to be married to that woman, so super appreciative of that. And let's give uh, some pub uh, to her. What's the uh, name of her catering company? It's called Food with Friends, and she does that for, uh, she's done it for a few years now. She does it for small events, friends of the family, uh, local area people, um, you know, nothing over 50 or 60 people max. And she does all the cooking and everything basically at the people's houses. And that way it's, it's not a lot of stuff here that we have to do. It's more prep work here and then going there and putting it all together. So super, super happy for her. She loves doing that. So she's Italian. She has to be cooking for people. And you know that I'm expecting some food for the 2020 championship, right? Absolutely. We are so excited to be hosting the 2020 national championships here in Virginia. So yeah, we're, I know our house is going to be really packed for that weekend. Uh, let's talk about one of another one of your former players. Uh, a certain player of yours is now an assistant coach at uh, uh, NJIT. Um, is he persona non grata right now? <laughs> he, Jack Wilson is uh, is the gentleman you are talking about, and I'll tell you, I couldn't be more proud of the kid. He, you know, went to play professionally after he graduated, and his shoulder was just. Uh, just couldn't hack it. It was, it was too much for him and it, it started to break down a little bit. So he changed gears and he worked for a year at Eastern Mennonite university, a little division three program here in Virginia and found it to his liking. And I remember I got a call and asked uh, about him and I, I said, Hey, you're not going to find a better young coach who's thirsty and, and ready to move on. And 
And uh, I could not be more proud of Jack. As as bombed and as disappointed as I am that I have to see him across the net, um, I, I know that he's going to do good things with them and, and, and bring a lot to the table. The real trick is how much did he remember the little things that I taught and how much of those things did he forget? But, you know, he also has some things of his own, I'm sure, that he's bringing. You know, that's that's the beauty of coaching. And I, and I think, you know, somebody made a mention that you, you can tell – how well you're doing by how many of your players move on to become coaches of their own. And, and I've been pretty blessed and pretty lucky that a few players over the years have chosen to go down that route. And, and, you know, my legacy as small as it is, uh, it's still very, very proud of each and every one of them. And I wish them all the best of luck. Except when uh, I play. You've uh, had um, quite a few uh, stops before coming to Mason. What's the one piece of advice that you've gotten from a previous mentor that uh, has really stuck with you? You know, I, I'll mention three uh, because they're the three that stick out the most in my mind. When I worked with Tom Pestalacci at Irvine Valley College, you know, Tom, for anybody who knows him, knows that he's, you know, he's a big kid at heart. And I, I kind of liken myself to that to some degree. And you know, he and I realized that, you know, we're not rocket scientists. We're, we're not curing cancer. We're basically coaches with a lot of great kids. And, and we're trying to put together a, you know, a, a season and a practice, a drill, whatever it is to, that'll make everybody get better. And, you know, we had a we had a phrase that we like to use every once in a while when we either got too high or too low. And that was there are 900 million people in China that could care less about what we do. Um, you know, that uh, the next person that I learned from was Hugh McCutcheon when I worked with him at the national team, you know, from him, I really learned the structure of a drill, the structure of a week's practices, how the tempo and how everything should look and how it should run, you know, and I also learned, I think a skill that is really undervalued and that's when to stop doing a drill. You know, when, when are we going past the, the, the point of no dividends being paid out and Hugh was just a master at those things. And so I really learned a lot from him in terms of, of how, to, how the practice gym should look. And if I look at terms from Mark Pavlik when I was at Penn State, he's the periphery of everything. He is the absolute pinnacle of how you run a program. I wasn't necessarily learning how to coach per se. I think he and I were pretty similar in things that we had run, but how he ran or how he runs that program on the, on the periphery, on the, you know, with the donors and the boosters and the administration and the travel and all, this, all the stuff that comes with it, he is just uh, tops in my book. And so from each one of those guys, you know, I, I took little specific components and, and, and brought it into the mix. And then obviously added my own personality and my own flair to the whole thing. But, you know, those three guys were very instrumental in helping shape who I am as a coach now. Um, and, and I couldn't be more thankful and grateful to have each one of them as a part of my coaching career style. Let's talk, uh, talk about the 2019 uh, schedule. You play three teams that made the tournament last year. Which uh, game, which match uh, really sticks out to you? Well, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I'm not one of those coaches that likes to circle certain matches. I schedule uh, as hard as I possibly can in terms of uh, putting together quality matches week in and week out. I don't think there's necessarily any any match that I'm looking at more forward to than the other, other than just going out and competing every single night. Um, and I know that's kind of a wishy-washy answer, but that's really kind of how I look at things. Uh, you know, it's easy it's easy to get lost in the ooh we've got Ohio State or ooh we've got UCLA or ooh we've got you know so and so. And and if you do it right, well, you should have those teams on your schedule anyways. Uh, so. You know, and, and it also comes down to what they're available to do. Not, not every one of those teams has the same week available that you do. So, you know, I may want, you know, all of them, and I can't have all of them. So I do the best that I can. But, you know, I, I, I think our schedule is extremely competitive. I think it's going to be a very fun year. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, I'll tell you what I'm excited about. I think there's two things that stick out to me. One, the Conference Carolinas are getting better. Barton's going to be a really, really good team this year. Uh, I think they're returning all of their starters. Uh, so anybody who's got them on their schedule should definitely not overlook them. And I think the EIBA, for for uh, for all intents and purposes, has gotten so much better. NGIT is going to be very good this year. Princeton's going to be very good this year. Uh, obviously, Penn State's going to be very good. Harvard's going to be good again. I mean, it's just that conference has just really increased its vision and scope. And I and the administration's 
of those schools need to be commended because they're the ones who allow those staffs to go out and get the best kids and have quality staffs that stick around instead of bouncing. I mean, you look at Sacred Heart, you know, they, they lost their coach to USC, but they picked up Bob Bertucci. I mean, if you don't know who Bob Bertucci is, then, then, then you aren't, haven't been part of the game for very long. The guy's a legend. Uh, and he's coming, I think, out of retirement in order to coach this team. Uh, that just shows you the level of, of, of him wanting to be a part of men's volleyball and especially being a part of the IBA. So, you know, I, I, I think it's going to be a dogfight no matter what night you look at on our schedule. Uh, and that's we wouldn't have it any other way. So you're telling me you have not circled April 12th and April 13th on your calendar yet? I'll be honest with you. Who are we playing on April 12th and April 13th? Harvard. Harvard. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll worry about them on April 11th. <laughs> I, I, I tell you, we we, uh, we beat them both times we saw them last year. Uh, and so I, I liked our chances of seeing them in the finals should we make it that far this year. And unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to. And hats off to them. You know, that's the first time in conference – or in conference – First time in history of that program they won an, uh, a conference title. That's pretty cool. You know, in the last three years, we've had three different teams win the championship. I think that's pretty cool. So conference is changing, and uh, and I couldn't be more happy for it. Uh, one of your phrases is going for milkshakes. Can you tell us the origin of that? <laughs> yeah, actually, I can. Um, my old boss, Tom Pestalacci, uh, not a drinker. Uh, by a long shot. And when we won the first state title, uh, when I was with him, I think 2007, uh, we were at his house and celebrating. And I told all the kids, you know, you should go out and have a few, uh, have a few beers uh, and celebrate. You guys deserve it. You've earned this. And Pesto kind of looked at me and said, yeah, I don't think it's very smart to recommend for the guys to go get beers. And I said, okay, go out and get a few milkshakes. Uh, because Pesto loves milkshakes. I don't know if you ever meet the guy, but he loves milkshakes. So from that time on, anytime I said, hey, go have a few milkshakes, um, you know, everybody kind of knows what I mean, but without really inferring it. And, uh, and so just kind of stuck with me all these years and uh yeah i i, I kind of like it actually you know <laughs> some people look at me and go milkshakes what, what what why don't you go out and have a couple of beers and i just kind of look at them and wink a little bit and go yeah go go have a couple of milkshakes so what is tom's favorite milkshake uh ooh, he likes oreo milkshakes mm, uh, good choice. and you know he's, he's just such a big kid of heart I, I don't think it really matters what flavor he eats but you know he's i think oreo is probably his favorite and uh, final question for you. Uh, thank you, and again, thank you for your time. Um, what would you consider a successful 2019 season? Is it uh, EA, EVA tournament champion or bust? I'd have to think at this point for this program and, and where we've been and what we've done, making the EVA tournament is, is an obvious answer of, of some success. Make it to the EIBA finals, I think, is a bitter, uh, a bigger, um, a bigger pat on the back. Uh, if we don't make that, I, I, I would be somewhat disappointed. Um, you know, but the reality is, is that every everything that happens, you know, it's it's a product of the things that you've done already and, and the work that you put in. And we always talk about the process. And and if you do, if you work the process the way that you're supposed to you know, the, the end results shouldn't really matter as much, uh, at least at this level. Um, you know, I, I, I'd like to think that we're capable of winning a national title. I'd like to think we're capable of making the final four. I'd like to think we're capable of winning the IBA. I'd like to think we're capable of making the IBA tournament, you know, and, and it's November right now. You know, we all of a sudden, we can get hit with a ton of injuries and guys can be killing out of school that I don't know about. And, and next thing you know, I've got three kids. Uh, and none of them have played any lick of volleyball, and we're going to the end of the year going, well, it was a good, it was a good run while we had it, but, um, yeah, I think, I think an EIBA title is, is probably the big, the big step up front that we want to get, uh, hanging on the banner, uh, but there's going to be a lot of guys, uh, and a lot of other teams that are going to do their best to try to make that not happen. Well, thank you for taking time with us off the block blog, and, uh, Thank you for uh, taking uh, 25 minutes of your time with us. We wish you nothing but the best in the 2019 season. It's all good. Thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate it. Take care, everybody. Thank you.